Dilya, once again, he's a PhD student. I believe he's based in Canberra or Sydney. I am currently in Canberra. In Canberra, in Canberra. So I'm going to hand over to him now, and he's going to present a, um, a talk on the nature of light. Thank you very much, Dilya. Thank you, Matt. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really upsetting that I can't see all of you. Um, it was quite an experience last year doing this with Matt, Delise, uh, Ingrid, and the rest of Astro 3D crew. Um, that's why this year when they asked me to do this again, I was very happy to be part of it. Um, as you can see from my background picture, this is where you could have been. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so be sure to join this every year as long as Matt still continues to organize this. Um, then you get to go to our Siding Spring Observatory. Just to give you an idea, this picture is actually taken in the middle of the night when it was pitch black at sight. I just took some long exposure photos and you can see the Milky Way in our one of our best observing location in the world. All right, uh, without further ado, let's get our show started. Let me share my screen. All righty, I trust everyone can see my screen now. So I am here to talk about nature of light to get the day started. I am sure that a lot of you might have already covered this. In that case, um, thank you all very much to your hardworking science teachers. Um, so a brief introduction about me. So who the hell am I? I am a PhD student, um, as Matt has said, from ANU, Australian National University in Canberra. Most of the time I will spend my time in Mount Str at Mount Stromlo Observatory, just right on the edge of um, um, Canberra. So if you do get a chance to visit, please come over and say hi. I study um, as part of Astro 3D, the motion of stars and gas in other galaxies. So we know that from a background photo, you can see that's our Milky Way galaxy, but there are other galaxies outside of our own. I look at the nearby ones, by nearby I mean about 1 billion light years away. Look at their stars and gas and how they move, and then I try to weigh the galaxy and tell, um, figure out how much they weigh. Now, um, just go back a little bit in history. Five years ago, um, I was a science undergraduate student in Sydney University studying math, physics, and languages because I liked both science and art. Um, and then when I was doing my undergraduate, I found my love for astronomy because of this one particular event, which was transit of Venus. Many of you may or may not remember, um, which was just this Venus, this little um, planet going across the surface of the sun. I was like, wow, gravity is awesome. That is making that planet moving in space on its own. That's when I decided to study astronomy. Going further back, when I was about your age, um, I was a high school student, yep, um, studying maths to become high school maths teacher. So um, right now is as close as I have been to teaching high school. So I would say maybe I'm still on that track. Um, okay, so what are we covering today? We are covering two main things. Many of you might have already covered this. In that case, I appreciate being here and learn it again. And the purpose of me covering these th uh, two points are basically to ensure everyone's on the same page, to prepare you for the talks to come later in the day. Now, we're going to look at um, how spectroscopy can be used to provide information about elements. How do we identify elements using spectroscopy? And the next thing is going to look at um, spectra of stars. We're going to look at spectra of stars um, to see if we can figure out the surface temperature, rotation, translational velocity, um, the density, and try to figure out um, what is in them, their chemical composition, by using our knowledge that we learn from identification of elements. All right, so basic introduction here, light. I know that many of you might already know the wave particle duality of light. But here, let's just quickly go over them just to, show, to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we all know that, um, or if you didn't, um, light, if we perceive it as a wave, it, we can describe it with a sine curve. We call it a sinusoidal wave traveling in space with oscillating electric and magnetic field perpendicular to each other. So some of the main 
um, characteristics are amplitude, wavelength, frequency, and the velocity. So that's the speed of light, right? That changes. So when they say you can never exceed speed of light, you can say, mm, in what medium? Because if you're in, if you put light in water, it'll be slower. So technically that barrier can be broken. Um, now, next page, if we look at the particle model of light, this is quite an evolutionary um, theory and hypothesis that proven to be quite correct and eventually won Einstein Nobel Prize, which essentially is this quantization of light. Um, this is where quantum physics come from. Um, so essentially we view light as discrete energy particles. So little packets of energy called photons and their energy can be described by a constant multiplied by the frequency. So you'll see V here in astronomy and physics in general, that is technically supposed to be new, a Greek alphabet. Um, yeah, so we have frequency and wavelength. So IE, um, higher the frequency, higher the energy, longer the wavelength, shorter the energy. Now, these are just the basic things that you should note. Now, light. So as I said earlier, lights can have higher frequency or longer wavelengths or vice versa. So that means light comes in in many flavors, for example, uh, let's put it that way. But the thing is, we all know that only a tiny fraction, very, very small fraction of light in the, visible, uh, in the entire spectrum is visible to us. Um, this scale actually shows it pretty well. And the thing is, um, in astronomy, we take advantage of light from one end of the spectrum to the other end. We have special telescopes designed to cover all of this um, entire spectrum. So, for example, we have gamma ray telescope, X ray telescope, UV telescope, visible light telescope. These ones will be in space, we have some visible, we have a lot of visible telescope on Earth, but UV, X-ray, gamma, they're mostly in space. So, um, and then infrared telescope and visible telescope, these are kind of combined because some, um, we can use mirrors to look at infrared light. So the only thing different there is the technique and the camera used. We also have microwave radio telescopes. So these are all radio now. So if you get a chance to visit Parks, the radio telescope, just a little bit north of Canberra, um, you would have known, you, if, if you've been there, you would have seen that there's a sign that said, please turn off your mobile phones and your car radios. The reason for that is that that radio telescope is so sensitive that they can pick up signals from your phone. Whereas we don't have this restriction at Kuna Barbara. We just ask you to turn off your torch or turn off your light. Um, so we can see these different telescopes can pick up different frequencies, uh, different wavelengths of light. Um, usually visible, um, so optical, we call this optical in invisible spectrum, optical, UV, X-ray, um, and gamma ray, we talk mostly in wavelengths, radio telescope, radio astronomers like to talk in um, frequencies. That's why you see the units here goes from microns to hertz or gigahertz or megahertz, kilohertz. That's just something to note. Um, so when we look at different frequencies or wavelengths, we look at different parts of an object. For example, if we see a galaxy that is very dusty, um, mostly black, for example, in my background, we'll see all these black patches. These are actually just the intergalactic um, dust in intergalactic medium in our galaxy. And using optical, this was shot with a regular DSLR, uh, we'll see that and we can't see beyond it. Whereas if we go to infrared, we'll see past it and we'll see what's in the center of our galaxy, for example. Now, next page. So light, where does it come from? So we have to go back to atom. Now, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to stick to a very simple Bohr model of atom. I'm sure many of you might have already covered this. Now, the idea here is that we imagine atom as this kind of tiny 
um, minuscule leveled planetary system, because I'm an astronomer, I'm going to use that analogy. So in the center, we have the nucleus, and then we have um, electrons in different states or in orbits. They're actually called orbitals, but that's a different concept. Um, so we have these orbits or states that electrons are allowed to be in. They are discrete. They are not continuous. What that means is that they are only allowed to be in certain shells at any given time, given their energy. But the thing is, what we found out is that electrons can go up and down to different discrete states. Um, for example, here we have uh, simple transitions in an hydrogen atom. When we go from um, ground state, which is n equals to one, we go up one level, two, three, four, five, six, we call this Lyman series. In astronomy, this is something that we use very often. We just say, oh, we look at Lyman alpha line or Lyman beta line, or we can look at the Bama series, or we can look at the passion series, bracket series. Essentially, that idea is that they can go up and down. When they absorb energy, they have enough energy to climb, so they will go up. And when they go down, they can sigh and catch a breath of relief and they will emit light. That's the idea. Absorption goes up, emission goes down. And now, the thing is, when we looked at how different atoms absorb and emit, absorb and emit, each different element has a different energy level states, configuration of energy level states. So what that means is that um, essentially, if you think of an onion, different atoms are different onions and no two shells are the same between onions. So this gives us a way to essentially distinguish based on which wavelength are light, uh, which wavelength is light being emitted or absorbed, and we can figure out what element they are. So essentially, if we color code it, excuse me, Essentially, if we color code each um, energy state and look at the lines they emit, we have this periodic table of elements or emission spectra of elements. So what they're saying is that every atom literally has a barcode. If you have the right scanner, you can figure it out. Now, <clears throat> how do we actually scan it or figure it out? Now, we have to look, go back and look at what's called uh, a black body. A black body essentially is, I don't know why they call it black body because they emit light at all frequencies and all wavelengths. Um, they provide you with a continuous spectrum. Now, this is a place where we start. We are looking at a continuous spectrum. There is no absorption, no emission. We have, well, actually we have emission at every frequency. Um, <clears throat> so we have a light source, we have the telescope, we have the spectrograph. So how do we get that rainbow? We use a um, very fancy instrument, which is actually just a piece of glass um, that will diffract light to different frequencies and make, create this rainbow. Now, what happens if we look to the side of it a little bit where there are gas, dust, or other, other medium? <clears throat> so if we have low density gas around the light emitting source, what will happen to that gas? What happens, what we found out, what happens is that the light will absorb some of the energy and then emit it. So the light gets warmed up a little bit. So much like when you're sitting right next to a radiator, like I currently am, you can't see at the moment, that radiation is constantly hitting me. Now, of course, I'm not low density gas, uh, low density gas. I hope I'm not very low density. Um, so, Essentially, what will happen is that that radiation will come, excite some of the atoms in me, actually not that energy, energetic, but let's think for a moment. And then what will happen is that the atoms, you know, the electrons in the atoms, they will go up a level. But the thing is, that's not stable. They'll hang around there for a bit and they say, nah, this is not where I want to be. I want to go back to where I was. I'm going to go down, emit light. As soon as they go down, emit light. So the when we look at it, we are no longer looking at we are no longer looking at the light source, so we don't see that whole continuous spectrum, but we only see the emission lines. So that's what happens when you look at 
look at it to the side, look at the side of it. Now what happens if you look directly through the gas, look at the light source. Now the continuous spectrum is gonna come back, but it's going to subtract the emission, where the emission lines would, would have been. So light source plus gas will give you absorption spectrum. So now, <clears throat> Spectroscopy, so earlier I said a piece of glass, right? How do we get that rainbow? It's essentially splitting light. You may or may not have done this experiment with a refraction prism. Essentially, in astronomy, we still use this um, very simplistic concept, except we make it fancier. We can have one prism, or we can have an array of different prisms. Actually, same prism, so and then when we have essentially one giant glass on the surface of it, all these tiny, 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 tiny prisms, we have what's called diffraction grading. When that happens, line goes to it, light goes to it, comes out, and it becomes a rainbow like that. That's how we disperse light. This way we can essentially take that one slit of light where it was just covered in a very narrow window in our visible spectrum, and we spread it out. Now, we essentially have magnified the wavelength window and we can have a look, okay, what do we see here? I have lost control, okay. Um, so when we do see that, we see the spectrum. So that's what essentially the idea of spectroscopy. We're going from electrons in an atom going up and down different energy level, absorbing, emitting light, and we look at this light and we go backwards to figure out where, what atoms or um, electrons were doing. <clears throat> so essentially, atom ion ions are molecules of the same type. Remember, I put in the same type here. So for example, hydrogen atom, you can have hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, you can have ionized hydrogen, you can have molecular hydrogen, so each of these will be written differently. So if it's just atom, you write H, neutral hydrogen, or if it's ion, ionize, you write H1 or H2. Um, in astronomy, we use um, Roman numeral H2 for ions. If we want to look at molecules, then we write H2, <laughs> which is H small two. Um, all of this, we call them hydrogen gas, but the thing is they are different states. Um, but the thing is within, and, and each of them will have different um, spectra. But the thing is, if you look at hydrogen, neutral hydrogen with neutral hydrogen, they will be the same. Hydrogen molecule with hydrogen molecule, they will be the same. But in between them, they're different. So this is another tool that we can, and that we have, that we can identify not only what element is in there, we can even figure out what kind of state it is in. Now, because these are unique, we can use them to identify each atom, ion, molecules. Now, another thing that we have covered is that black body emits a continuous spectrum. Now, if you look at it, um, if you look at the black body light source through a cloud of gas, you will have some blockage, and hence we have absorption spectra. But if you look to the side of it, just covering the light source, just look at the gas, you'll have emission spectra. Now, all right, just make sure everyone's on the same page. Just wanna know if anyone has any question at this stage. Matt, I can't see my question thing. Okay, I don't see any question yet. All right, let's continue. So now we are going to move to stars. I hope that this Q&A thing is not blocking the view. All right, so we moving on to stars. We learned the basics of light. How do we apply to astrophysics? Now, the idea here is very much the same. We treat stars as a black body. Most of them are. Now, the thing is, each star has a photosphere. A lot of, almost all stars have photospheres, which is very hot. The surface of our sun is covered with photosphere, which is about 6,000 Celsius. But if we deep dive, I don't recommend doing this, deep dive into the center of a star, it is much hotter. 
And so essentially what happens if you have a very hot core and a somewhat cooler gas on the surface, if we look at it, we get absorption spectra. Now, this is the absorption spectra of the sun. You will see this many times today. Essentially, the idea is that all of this was supposed to be one long strip, but just for visualization purpose, someone has done a very um, lovely job of chopping it up and stacking them and color coding them. Remember, every color you see in astronomy is false. Don't trust it. But essentially, the idea is that on the top left, we have red wavelengths. On the bottom right, we have short wavelengths, blue wavelengths. Essentially, if we were to collapse it, it looks something like this, because this figure is kind of hard to um, analyze. So we do what's called a dimensionality reduction. Essentially, the idea is that 2D to 1D. So what we have here is that this is called a spectrum. We look at this very often. Essentially, the idea is that at each wavelength in nanometers, um, some astronomers use angstrom, some astronomers use nanometers, radio astronomers use frequencies, more or less the same thing. Uh, on the y-axis, we have intensity. In, any, uh, um, in a particular, it will be in whatever unit that the astronomer deems necessary. So you can see that we have essentially a black body light here, which is a curve. And at every now and then there's a dip. So these are being absorbed. So less intense. Now, if we look at a bunch of stars, this is what we see. This picture was actually, this graph um, I actually created um, some time ago from real observations um, across different uh, using um, a bunch of different stellar libraries. For example, for me, I study, even though I study galaxies, I still need to know um, what stellar spectra look like because I will have to use these models, um, <clears throat> not models, to use these observations. These are really high signal to noise ratio, really good quality observation as a as model for my galaxy observation. Um, essentially, the idea is that if I stack enough of these enough, I will have um, a spectrum of a galaxy. So now you, here you can see that each different color, color spectrum looks a bit different. <clears throat> and that is what we see. We, we, we have looked at a whole lot of stellar spectra. Um, if you like, you can ask your teacher to look up um, Gaia survey, G-A-I-A, -A, Gaia. They just did a recent data release. This is publicly, publicly available. Essentially what they did is that they sent a space probe into space just to look at as many stars as they can and get their spectra. Uh, and, and they get their spectra. Um, so we have really high signal to noise um, stellar spectra library. And here I plotted a few of them and you'll see, yes, they are very different. Why, that, why is that? Turns out <clears throat> if we were to classify these, there are um, actually about a dozen or so different classes they can go into. So people did this more than a hundred years ago. So um, this lady called Annie Cannon, um, an astronomer from Harvard, they developed the system. So essentially back in the day, what happens is that astronomy was very much a game for old white men. Unfortunately, to a degree, it still is currently, but in Astro 3D, we're working very hard to make a more balanced, more diversified um, cohort in astronomy. But back in the day, what will happen is that um, an astronomer will hand off this massive amount of data to um, what they call back in the time computers. That's where the word computer kind of comes from. Essentially, they're like, hey, um, Annie, I have a crap ton of spectra. Could you look through them, please? And what she realized is that there is a trend. There is a discrete classification that she can put these stellar spectra into just based on, you know, how strong the hydrogen lines were. So she devised a kind of a system. They say, okay, strongest, we call it A, weaker line B, weaker still C, all the way to O. 
Um, so this was essentially the first stellar spectra class that very early astronomers kind of adopted. Um, but the thing is, um, <clears throat> the, to review this system, they're like, okay, that's pretty good. Um, we're going to do some improvements. So they say, all right, we're going to remove some of these um, classes because we hardly see any stars in those classes. So they're not the common ones. Okay, fair enough. And then they say, um, there might be a bigger gap in between, so we would like to subdivide them. All right. And <clears throat> they were then rearranged a little bit. Because remember, previously she organized it from the hydrogen line strength. Now we're going to go by um, stellar temperature, surface temperature. So now it became O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So there are many ways to remember this. Um, essentially, the hottest stars are O, and then this, and, and the coolest stars are M. And one way um, some people do is mnemonics. And here is an example: only boring astronomers find grand student knowing mnemonics. Now, uh, like I said earlier, the International Astronomical Union decided to subdivide this into different uh, ten numbers going from zero to nine. So O0 is very, very hot star. Whereas M9 will be very cool, small, perhaps a dwarf star. <clears throat> now, I said that they reorganized this with surface temperature. How did they measure the surface temperature? Essentially here, we can measure, <clears throat> um, so we're having a bit of a feedback. Okay, I will try to move away from my mic. Well, okay, so to measure surface temperature of stars, we look at the black body spectrum. Yes, earlier when I showed this, there are a lot of absorptions, but if we were to mask them, we can see that overall it is still a black body spectrum and they peak at different positions. So this is called Wayne's displacement law. Essentially the idea is that if you take, if you look at where the galaxy, where the spectrum um, is peaking in the wavelength and you, and you multiply that to a temperature, you have a constant um, number. So essentially the idea is that peak wavelength multiply the temperature equals to this constant number. So they would have had a um, different method to measure the te temperature back in the day. But when they've done enough of them, they, figure, uh, they realize that this is a scaling relation and it always holds true. So because they did the hard work for a lot of stars early on, the later on people, they would kind of figure out temperatures of spike going the reverse. Now, that's the temperature. Another concept is velocities of stars. Now, essentially the idea of velocity, um, there are many different um, definitions of velocity, but here we're going to have a look at what's called Doppler effect. So essentially the velocity mostly comes from the Doppler effect on light. The idea is that when something is moving relative to you, the wavelength changes a little bit. So for example, if my hand is coming towards the camera, well, it can't pick it up, but the, what's happening is that every light in front of it is getting a bit of compressed. So for example, this is what we see almost every day when a train comes by, this is the example that has been done to death, um, or a emergency vehicle goes by, it goes from very high pitch to very low pitch. Pitch is frequency, high frequency to low frequency. So, and as you can see, I have also color coded the words here. So the idea is that when it moves away, increase in wavelength. When it moves towards you, decrease in wavelength. What happens to light when you increase the wavelength? It becomes redder. What happens when you compress light and decrease the wavelength? It becomes blue shifted. So this is, this idea we have is called blue shift. Um, red shift and blue shift. We don't use blue shift a lot because there are not a lot of cosmic things that are moving towards us. Very few. Most things are red shift. Um, so that's another concept, red shift, blue shift. Now, 
<clears throat> what does it actually look like to astronomers? So we have um, reference lines that we do in the lab. These are thankfully done from a lot of chemists, uh, by a lot of chemists um, in a very controlled environment. We look at elements of, uh, spectra of all the elements and molecules and um, ions. So we have a library, like I showed earlier, the periodic table, that is essentially a standardized reference lines. Um, and then we can see that for some stars, they absorption line. Remember in stars, we see absorption lines because we are looking at the star directly and through gas. Uh, we see absorption spectrum and they are slightly moved to the left. And for some of them, they slightly move to the right which is move to the redder end of the spectrum or move to the blue end of the spectrum. And the formula is actually quite simple. Um, the change in this wavelength where it's supposed to be, um, where we observed it to be, lambda observed, minus where it's supposed to be, lambda not, is essentially the redshift value. Um, the ratio between them minus one is ratio value. That's how we define it. And essentially is the velocity at which the star is um, traveling against the speed of light. Um, and we have redshift. Now, stars, if we imagine to be a giant sphere, they also rotate. So they're not only just moving across the space, they are also rotating across the space, M much like what Earth is doing around the sun, but a lot of stars are doing the same thing around the center of a galaxy. And the thing is essentially, what we have to do now is construct a spectrum. This first sentence here to measure rotation velocity is, it is first necessary to obtain intensity versus wavelength plot. That is essentially the spectrum. Um, if they are rotating, if we look at, um, top view of a star, right? If there's no rotation, all the lights from all position of the star is coming um, from the same position. They are, there's no motion, nothing is compressed, they're just translational. And then you don't see any redshift there. But the thing is, if there is a rotation, one part of the star is going to be coming towards you, the other part is going to, moving, to be moving away from you, whereas the center is still. So that means the wavelength on one part of the star is going to be blue shifted. The other part is going to be red shifted. Blue shift plus red shift, that means essentially the spectrum is going to go spread out a little bit. Um, so, and the thing is when they are spread out, now the thing is we don't have the optical resolution to look at each individual part of the star that are very far apart. We can do that for some of the close by, but because they are far apart, so essentially these um, separation will become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller for further away star. So what is supposed to be this becomes slightly like this. Um, essentially what that means is that spectral lines are broadened. And the broader they are, the faster they are rotating. So um, here's a question for you all to think about or ask your teachers, what do you think will happen to binary stars? So stars, two stars going together and they're rotating. Um, that's for you to go and look up. They're actually very fascinating. So essentially there's another concept which is translational, all right? We look at something from face on and we see this, but what if you look at it from the top? All you see is this way. They're not coming towards you and this is a, um, visualization that's, by, that's done by the Keck. And when we look at the center of our Milky Way, we see something like this. So they, they kind of uh, theorized this model. So, okay, this is probably what we're observing. And they did uh, go and observe it. So this is actually real observation. So you can see the stars in the center of our galaxy, they are moving. And you can see the very center one when it gets to that point, it speeds up a little bit. All right, um, so here's another thing to, for all the 
teachers to ask your students what do they think is in there. And you, another thing to note is that you can see as, ye, as, as observation goes on, the stars go from big fuzzy blob to very small precise points. Um, the reason for that, if you noticed it, is that um, our observational techniques simply got better. We developed techniques such as adaptive optics. Essentially the idea is that because our atmosphere is creating all this fuzz, fuzzy blobs, um, we can use something called adaptive optics to correct for that. The same reason you will see uh, morning stars, they will be twinkling. It's actually our atmosphere adding this extra effect. If we correct for it, the star actually is still pinpoint sharp and very small in size. Yep, so that is translational velocity. How do we calculate it? So essentially the translational velocity is the velocity that is not along the line of sight. So it's moving from side to side. Now the thing, um, how do we calculate that? Is that we calculate, um, we first have to figure out what velocity is moving towards or away from us first. So we have the radial velocity um, because essentially the how to remember that is that it's moving along the radius. Um, so we use Doppler shift, we use redshift to figure out the radial velocity of stars. And then we look at how far it is. <clears throat> and now we look at the tangential velocity, sorry, which is perpendicular to the line of sight. So essentially what we do is that, yep, we get its distance and its proper motion. Proper motion is essentially um, number of arc seconds is move across the sky each year. Um, distance, we can use something like parallax or surface brightness because we know how hot a star is supposed to be, we know how bright it is supposed to be. And we compare the difference, um, compare what is measured and what is supposed to be, and we have the distance. Um, then we have the proper motion, yes. Um, so stellar astronomers are actually very lucky because this, target of observations actually move. Whereas for example, for me, when I study galaxies, I cannot use this technique. Galaxies take forever to move a distance that, that I can tell by one pixel. So whereas for stellar astronomers, they can actually see that their stars are moving. So they measure that over a period of one year or two years or 10 years. Um, they have their radial velocity and they have the distance, they get the tangential velocity. Now, <clears throat> so that's how we measure tangential velocity. So we, know how, we now know how hot stars are, how to measure the temperature, and we, can, we know how they are traveling, what velocity they're traveling at along the line of sight and perpendicular to the line of sight. So next thing to learn about is density or aka pressure. They're more or less the same thing, higher density, higher pressure. So <clears throat> to look at that, we go back to the spectrum because that's where we are going to dig out all this information. Now, essentially the idea is that we look at what's called line strength, essentially how deep that absorption line goes, the contrast between where the um, continuum is and where the absorption is. So less dense, if, if uh, the, um, the lower the pressure of a photosphere, um, narrower the line is. Whereas higher pressure um, will have slightly broader <clears throat> um, absorption line. So you can see here, blue giant, it's giant, but it's not very um, dense, it's puffy. So the lines are pretty, um, the lines are pretty high contrast. The um, line strength is pretty strong. Whereas if you look at dwarf, which is very, very dense, um, stars. These are essentially stars that are already died. Um, they are not. They're not really doing um, what's called um, nuclear fusion. Uh, nuclear fusion, actually. Um, they're no longer doing that. So they are very dense. What we see is this slightly broader and more blurred um, absorption lines. So that gives us an idea about the density. So. Moving on, chemical composition. So this will, uh, given everything that I've told you about, that we can use these barcodes of um, stellar spectra 
we it's it's not very surprising that if we stack enough of them here we will see we will be able to figure out what is in a star so essentially we will go back to this plot the rainbow of the sun oh cool. yep so if we are just presented this, we try to figure out, okay, what star, what gas is in there, it'll be a bit difficult. But the thing is, we know what each gas looks like. The idea then is to use this library of stellar template and fit for this. Um, that's something that astronomers do all the time. We fit our spectra uh, with, um, spectrum template library um, <clears throat> and we can even figure out how much of each gas is in there based on the intent of each template so if we say okay this template I need um, for example I need a lot of hydrogen because a lot of stars have a lot of hydrogen in there I, I, I need a hydrogen template I need for example in this very picture we have mercury we also need mercury template but hydrogen template times 100 plus one times mercury we kind of have a mercury to hydrogen ratio here and that's how we know okay this stars is say 99% uh, hydrogen and 1% mercury just as an example um, so essentially spectrum template fitting is what we do to figure out um, chemical composition of stars. I actually do the same with um, galaxies, example, for example, essentially, but the only difference is that I use stellar templates. I don't use elemental templates. Um, I don't use that actually. Uh, no, I, I use um, stellar templates to construct a galaxy template so I know what kind of stars are in there. So I know, um, <clears throat> okay. Let's try this. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so by fitting galaxy spectrum with a library of stellar templates, I know what kind of stars are in there and I will know, and by, by knowing what kind of stars are in there, I will know what kind of elements are in there because some stars will have a lot of heavy irons, ions, <clears throat> heavy, heavy metals. So for example, in later on with Chris, you will learn, how elements evolve within the stars. We start with hydrogen, helium, okay, and then the elements get heavier and heavier, heavier and heavier. At some point they will reach iron. And that's about as far as they can go for most stars. And if I look at a galaxy and say, oh wow, okay, there are a lot of stars that have a lot of iron. And we also have a lot of elements that are heavier than iron. That's one way to figure out how old the galaxy is by looking at the chemical composition. If your entire star only has hydrogen and helium, that means that's a fairly young star. And for me, if I look at a galaxy and I realize a lot of, if my galaxy has a lot of young star, that means it's a young galaxy. So that's essentially how we figure out chemical composition and then take another step further, estimate the age of stars or galaxies. So now let's do a summary. Um, we looked at stars. Stars just like black body spectrum with a shroud of gas around it. They have absorption, absorption spectra. Now, if you look at enough of these spectra from different stars, you can classify them into these discrete classification schemes. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Um, that's based on temperature, remember? <clears throat> now the surface temperature how do we determine that is using Wayne displacement law. By look, um, the idea is that the peak wavelength, the wavelength where the spectrum is, has the highest value, multiplied by the temperature equals to one constant. Um, so if we go the opposite way, we can figure out the temperature. And now to figure out the motion of stars, we look at, we use the Doppler effect. We look at the start along the line of sight, blue shift towards us, red shift away from us. And then when a star rotates, just imagine if you look at the opposite ends of a star, this will broaden the absorption lines. 
Now, translational velocity is when we look at the radial velocity and you do a vector addition to the translational velocity <clears throat> and to the tangential velocity. And now we have the translational velocity. Tangential velocity, remember, is essentially how many pixels is it moving across the sky each year? To a degree. Um, so that's how we get the translational velocity. And density of the star is just by looking at its line strength. Does it have very high contrast or is it very blurred um, emission line, or absorption lines? That gives us an idea about the density. Now we do, um, then we look at a, this superposition of spectra um, and we compare that to a library of stellar templates, or no, elemental templates, spectral templates, to figure out what chemical composition makes up a star. That's how we figure out what's in it. And I believe that is the entirety of my talk. Thank you all very much. I hope I haven't put a lot of you to sleep. If there is any question, my eyes are peeled on the Q&A section. Otherwise, thank you all very much. Over back to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Duya. I'll leave the Q&A section open. Um, so if you have a question, just jump in the Q&A. It's down the bottom next to the chat. I did see someone raise their hand with a question there. I'm happy to answer anything, any question that you have about this talk or any other general astronomy questions that you're curious about. I will try to answer, um, try my best to answer that. Would my PowerPoint be available? Um, I will be giving this to Matt and um, I believe um, Matt will organize something about that. Yes, yes, thank you very much, Dewey. I will um, we'll put the PowerPoints on the Astro 3D website. Um, and we'll also, um, so you can go there to access them in the educational section. All right, so I got another question. Thank you, Elijah. So how do we know if a galaxy is new or old, if there are numerous new stars and numerous old stars? Okay, that is a very good question. <clears throat> so aging a galaxy. Essentially, we look at galaxy as a whole. For nearby star uh, galaxies, we can look at each different regions. Um, oh, sorry, I just realized my mic is mute. Um, so the question is, how do we know if a galaxy is new or old, if there are numerous stars, new stars and numerous old stars? So essentially we look at galaxies a lot of time as a whole, because they are very far away. We can't really look at each individual part. For some nearby galaxies we can, um, but then we can't really say galaxy as a whole without some sort of averaging. Now the idea is that we look at galaxy as a whole, we look at the stars, we look at the chemical compositions, we devise a ratio. Um, essentially the idea is that if you have a lot of hydrogen, very small trace amount of metal, that's a relatively new star. But if you look at a galaxy with a lot of heavy metal, not a lot of gas, we actually have a lot of observations of this type of galaxies where we find no gas at all. We find no gas at all, no emission lines, only absorption lines. That means this galaxy only has stars, no gas. What happened to all the gas? All transformed into stars. These galaxies are old galaxies. They have been around for ages. And what we also realize is that a lot of these galaxies, very heavy, because what's happening is that they're constantly absorbing nearby smaller galaxies. They have really, really high mass. Just to give you an idea, now, the mass of the sun is about two times 10 to 30 kilograms. Now let's use that as one unit. We call it solar mass. Now small galaxies, newer galaxies or dwarf galaxies. Um, so in my picture behind me, you, yep, yeah, you'll see right about here. This is large Magellanic cloud. For a lot of you, you may or may not see it when you go outside in the middle of the night, if you are in a remote location. Sorry for everyone in Sydney, you will not be able to see this large Magellanic cloud. That mass is about 10 to the four to 10 to the five, essentially one followed by four zeros or one followed by five zeros times the mass of the sun. These are relatively smaller galaxies and they have a lot of 
gas in them. And we actually see that in the picture. <clears throat> Whereas these older galaxies, they have 10 to the 12, 1 billion times, 1 trillion times the sun of the a mass of the sun. Those galaxies tend to be older. So that's how we know if galaxy is old or new. All right. Um, so next question. What is the amount and type of radiation emitted dependent on? Amount of radiation and type of radiation. Um, so it depends on what is driving the radiation. Essentially for a star, the stellar, uh, the light that we see from a star is nuclear fusion or nuclear fusion. And that is essentially a, you would have learned about that and that is emitting energy. That will give us the amount, the amount and the type of radiation because the energy level, remember, is very specific for each atom. So it's only when you receive that type of energy and amount of energy, you will have this kind of excitation and emission or absorption. Whereas for Centaur galaxy, for example, that's driven by different things. We see, we have another concept of active galactic nuclei, for example, that is not driven by nuclear fusion or fusion, um, but that is driven mostly by this colliding of into uh, colliding of gas and stars around our supermassive black hole everything heats up really quickly and then emits an energy energy and radiation so what it depends on is really a broad question and it depends on what the source of the radiation is all right what is uv catastrophe i've heard it from somewhere all right um uv catastrophe is i don't know Actually, this is a concept that I am not very familiar of, but feel free to pass it on to Chris Lidman, who will be joining right after me. He might have a better idea. So how much does our sun spin relative to our galaxy? Um, so essentially, this is a question really suited for a stellar astronomer. <clears throat> so what, uh, how fast does our sun spin relative to our galaxy? So I take it the idea is that how fast does it take for our sun to go around our galaxy? Um, the answer to this question is um, somewhere, some of a very long time, um, our galaxy itself also spins. There's a rotation velocity in our galaxy. So essentially, if we look at stars, this is the center of our galaxy, by the way. Uh, let me see if there right there so if you can see my background this bright spot is our center of galaxy what we do is actually is that we look at how the gas and stars here move compared to how the gas and stars move around here where the head of the emu is that gives us an idea how fast our galaxy spins and we are you might you may or may not have seen the um, illustration that says oh our sun is probably around here somewhere somewhere in the spiral arm of a galaxy now the idea is that um there's a big difference uh i don't know the exact number from the top of my head but usually um give or take um it's about about a billion years for our sun to go around our ga uh, galaxy i might be wrong so um i would say plus minus half a billion years. <laughs> so that's about as best of an um, answer I can give you without going further into the research. Um, if, next question, so if a stellar spectrum has narrow lines, is that interpreted as low rotational velocity or low, a low density? Oh, that is a very good question. So <clears throat> now we are going to look at, so yeah, so because essentially I say, I say okay, broader or um, lower line strength, there are two different concepts, but they're, they're very similar. I can see that there can be a confusion here. But remember, we have a, each element, we have different um, absorptions at different wavelengths. So we have a lot more information there we can confirm. Um, we can do a comparison between the continuum and the absorption to figure out the line strength. Remember, it has to be really high contrast. Um, so just if we look, if we look at the only information that it, that it is just narrow, we can't tell really 
it's a bit, it'll be very difficult. We need more information. So if we really want to figure out if it's low rotational velocity or low density, we'll have to look at the other lines in the same spectrum to see where in this region of spectrum, which region of the spectrum give us the most information, then we can make a decision from there. All right, how do neutron stars fit into the emission spectrum? Wow, that's a very interesting question. So neutron stars, um, I'm not sure how much you guys learned about neutron stars. So neutron stars are part of a life cycle of very specific um, mass range of stars. So not all stars become a neutron stars at the end. Some become dwarf stars, some become black holes. Um, so for neutron stars to happen, you have to start off with certain amount of mass in the star. And when, what happens is that when the star is so massive, the electron and proton starts to merge. Everything collapses to neutrons, but not quite massive enough for it to become black hole yet. So essentially they have this pool of neutron stars. Neutron stars. So are they emitting or are they not emitting? The answer is, I forgot. <laughs> um, so neutron stars, presumably they will also emit energy. So even though we say that electrons, when, when you have just a neutron, there is no emission, but what happens is that what we can have what's called quantum fluctuation. What happens is that even though, if, even if an, an electron is not supposed to go to a certain state, sometimes they will. We call this forbidden lines. Um, when that happens, we will see the emission lines or the absorption line, depending on where in the region you were looking at. And neutron stars, we can also look at their rotational velocities. And so we have an idea of the mass. We can look at the rotation curve um, essentially each part of the star and then how much are they rotating we can figure out the mass and a lot of people can figure out neutron stars that way um, but um, don't settle for the answer I just gave you go ahead and do more research um, like I said I study a lot of galaxies so neutron stars really kind of out of my forte and so yeah go and do uh, do some research and see what you can find and share it with us. Um, Dewey, if you can hear me, I just have a question from one of my students, Fred. Sure, sure. The question is, how come the sun's spectra has both hazy and narrow spectral lines? Hazy and narrow spectral lines. <clears throat> or some thicker than, and thinner than others in the same mm -hmm, star. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, some lines are thicker, some lines are thinner. Some are denser, some are less dense. Now, the thing is, remember the surface of the sun, we're looking through the photosphere and the surface of the sun is not static. It's constantly boiling. Some parts go up, some parts go down, right? Compression, Compression. depression. When that happens, denser region, less dense region. So if you remember looking at a, um, photo of the sun, depending on what wavelength you look at, you'll see little granulates of darker spots, brighter spots. Some areas are cooler, some areas are hotter, some areas are denser, some areas are less dense. So that's how we have both um, high contrast, very thin lines and broad lines, blurred lines. So because the very surface of the sun is active, we will be able to see these very small details. I hope that answers your question. Next question. So how does the velocity of a black hole affect the shift of wavelength of light that escapes from its orbit? And does this change the way we see a galaxy spectra? Thank you, Justin. Let me read that question again so I understand. How does the velocity of a black hole affect the shift of wavelength of light that escapes from its orbit? Now, the idea here is that <clears throat> we need to be careful when we say escapes from its orbit because depending on where in the orbit you are, you, some lights can't escape black holes. But if you can escape, that means they're not actually within an area that's called event horizon. So, <clears throat> um, you may or may not have seen the recent um, event horizon telescopes image. 
um, about a black hole of, of a black hole. If you haven't, I highly recommend your teachers to pull that up right now. Just look for event horizon telescope image of black hole. What you will see is essentially a black disc in the middle and the ring of light around it. Now, what is happening? What is the light source here? <clears throat> so essentially the idea is that as things fall into black hole, if they pass the event horizon, that's pitch black, okay, but just before it passes the event horizon, everything gets as close as possible, as close as possible. And there are a whole lot of things that can get as close as possible. What happens if stars, gas, particles, dust get very close and crowded? They heat up. The very much the same reason why you are all huddle up together in cold winter days to get heat. Now imagine you get squished as much as possible, squished as much as possible, and you are spinning around the black hole. Things get really hot. It's hot enough, you get light, you start radiation. When it's just a little bit hot, you get infrared. A little bit hotter than that, you get optical. And then you start climbing up the spectrum. Eventually, at some point, you reach X-ray. Um, <clears throat> or you can even reach UV, depending on how hot you get. Now, this disc, this little torus around, um, around the black hole, we call active galactic nuclei, AGN. Um, late, uh, later on in the day, Lisa will all probably also cover a little bit about what AGNs are. Essentially, um, there are many different definitions, but what it boils down to is the mechanism that the center black hole is very active. There are a lot of things falling in there. And there's a lot of light coming out. And how does it shift the wavelength? Um, essentially, if we look at the center torus as a whole, it's very similar to what we see to a stellar spectrum. We will see the broad line, uh, line broadening because it is rotating. There will be a rotation velocity. There will be velocity that's going in all sorts of direction. Tangential velocity, you will also see some of that. Um, <clears throat> and then essentially, how does it change the way we see galaxy spectra? What will happen there is that so many things are being dumped into the center black hole, um, radiations are getting so dense, temperature is getting so hot, we will see a lot of heavy elements. <clears throat> so we'll see lines that we don't see in other galaxies, and in, uh, in other stars. Um, when we look at the spectrum of these kind of, the galaxies that have um, AGN, what we see is that they have very distinct absorption line and emission lines that we don't see in other parts of galaxies. Um, so they have, essentially the idea is that when you look at enough of galaxy spectra, you'll see some of them have these features. They're not very common. And so they, that's why when, we, when astronomers look at them, they're like, I don't know what that is. So I'm gonna call it quasi-stellar object. Hence the name quasar came about. But they, later on, they realize, a lot of these quasars, what people have thought are just weird stellar objects, are actually very far away galaxies with very active galactic nuclei that are emitting these kind of lights. And they became their own class of objects, AGN. So yeah, that's how black holes can affect the spectrum of galaxy. Does fusion occur within the accretion disk of a black hole? <clears throat> Thank you, Nadia. Now, when does fusion happen? Fusion happens when you have proton hitting nucleus. Um, now, I don't have a definitive answer of this, but given the violent and chaotic nature of an accretion disk, where a whole lot of chemical and physical um, reactions are going on, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. And it probably will happen because, and probably it does happen because we do see um, these emission lines and absorption lines. And so it will depend on what energy level that astronomers observe, uh, that, that can measure. Essentially, to answer that question, I don't know if it does happen definit definitively, definitively, but the method I imagine would be, we look at the line strength, right? <clears throat> if we're looking at emission, emission lines, we look at, okay, how 
much of this photon are we measuring compared to the background? If it is a lot, so much so that we see, okay, only fusion can trigger this kind of emission, this kind of intensity, then we say yes. If it's not, then maybe not. So that would be the method I imagine that we go, that we use to figure out if there is fusion going on. Yep, and I think that was the last question. If there is no more question, I'm handing it back over to Matt. Um, thank you very much, Dilya. I um, really appreciate your talk and um, you know the introduction to what is light. And you can see that it, you know it starts off very simple, and light is complicated. Light is interesting. Yeah, definitely, especially in an interstellar kind of medium where you have so many different sources of light, it can be very interesting. Um, so thank you, Dilya. And what we're going to do now is we're going to have a bit of a morning tea break. Um, so um, just before we go, um, we're going to resume at 10.30 with um, Associate Professor Chris Lidman. So if you want to dismiss your students in a moment, and we'll see you back here at 10.30. Thank you once again, Dilya, on behalf of everyone watching today. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the day. Be sure to ask as many questions as you can. Chris Lidman, Lisa Curley, and Carolyn Foster, they're very knowledgeable people. And just bombard them with your questions. Cheers. Thanks, Julia. Scrolling down to the last bullet point there, investigate the types of nucleosynthesis reactions involved in main sequence and post main sequence stars, including but not limited to the proton proton chain and the CNO cycle, the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cycle. 